Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today. I'd like to welcome the scholars, the alum, and our lovely panelists who have taken time out of their busy schedule to be here. Now, before we start, a few housekeeping rules. In the event of a fire alarm, <laughs> you have an exit here, exit at the back as well, and the assembly point is on the bridge. And the other point is because this is going to be broadcast live, I would request the members of the audience to turn off their mobile and any other gadgets that would uh, disrupt the recording. Thank you. So it's been 10 years since I started here in Cambridge. Wonderful 10 years. And like most of you here, we have experienced the magic that is Cambridge thanks to the generosity of the Gates Cambridge Trust. And I would like to thank them for that. So the <laughs> So today is a testament of the work that has gone into putting together events such as these across the world to bring in alum together and bring alum and scholars together as well. And it shows about how our spirit of getting connected and staying in touch keeps going forward. And that's largely because you guys are interested and you plug in. And we hope to see more of you in future events. So please do respond to all the emails that you get from the Trust and from the alumni and scholars for events. So before I start introducing the event, I'd like to actually personally thank a few people who have made this day possible. To begin with, the Trust for their continued generosity in funding and supporting all the events that we put forward to them. So thanks especially to Jim, Jim, <laughs> David, who is on the other side in the office uh, hosting uh, this panel discussion, uh, Lucy, Joe, Mandy, thank you so much for putting together all the admin side of this event. And from the, the Gates Alumni Association, the one person I would like to thank especially is Laura, who is a director of membership. Uh, she actually coordinated this sitting in the US, but unfortunately she could not make it for this weekend because she's giving her viva next week. So I would like to wish her all the very best. And I'm sure she's watching us as well, she, as she mentioned. And so is Emily as well. She couldn't make it today, who helped put together the uh, brunch tomorrow, the social event tonight, as well as the panel, the second panel. <laughs> so she will be joining us later this evening. And the others on the GCA that I would like to thank in particular is Samir, who helped this morning's uh, sporting event. Thank you for turning up, despite the weather. And just so that I don't forget, Greg, Nathan, and Lauren, who are on our board have helped again in various bits from technology to advising us what to do. Next coming on, the other half of this whole event was organized by the Gates uh, Scholars Council and to them I'm really indebted. Thank you for reaching out to us. Haliki, oh, she's downstairs waiting to welcome more members. So she has liaised between the trust, between us, the Alumni Association and the Scholars Council to make sure that today we are sitting in this particular room. And Andrew, thank you so much for initiating the discussions. And I'd also like to thank the social sex, Han. And uh, I think I only have to Katrina. <laughs> so as you can see, this is also an event where you get to make new friends and rekindle old friendships. So thank you. You guys are wonderful. And am I forgetting anyone else? So without further ado, I would like to welcome our new Provost, Professor Barry Everett. He has been the master of uh, Downing College and he holds, let me get this right because I was told that last time I didn't get it right. It was the behavior, he's the professor in behavioral neuroscience at the Department of Psychology. Did I get it right this time? <laughs> no, I'm, we are very grateful, uh, Barry, because you've only been here for about a couple of weeks and you've reached out to us and engaged with us. I hope that moving forward, alumni relationships go from strength to strength and we have many more such events like this. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Barry. Thanks everyone. It's, it's very good to get applause before you've ever done anything. So I, I really approve of this. So welcome to uh, everybody here to this Gates Alumni Weekend. It was a good cricketing morning. Did cricket happen? I bet it didn't, did it? It happened in spirit. It happened in spirit. Um, and it's a particular pleasure to be welcoming you here to a Gates Alumni 
weekend within the first well, three weeks, actually, of becoming pro provost. And that three weeks of being provost has already revealed to me the tremendous energy and enthusiasm that's embodied in the Gates scholars who are, who are here in Cambridge. And you will have all discovered how wonderful it is to be a Gates scholar in Cambridge. But I hope that people are also discovering today how great it is to be a Gates scholars alumna or alumnus and to be back in Cambridge. And it's really good to welcome the alumni back here for this event. So a big thank you added to the thank you you've just had from Mumta to all of those who've been involved in bringing it about, alumni, the Scholars' Council, and the wonderful staff in, in the Trust office. And I want to especially thank our uh, panel discussants who are here this afternoon, not only for agreeing to come and, and join us here, but to do so on a Saturday and to struggle through the traffic to get into Cambridge. And I hope you find these discussions challenging and enjoyable. And it, it really also seems to me that the panel discussions we have today uh, really immediately reveal the overarching aims of the Gates Cambridge Trust, which is to improve people's lives, to change people's lives for the better. And you will very much be discussing today people's lives, often lives under challenging circumstances, and how might they might be improved now and in the future. And I think that's a, a great thing to do from such an interdisciplinary perspective. So the very warmest of welcomes for some really hard work this afternoon uh, before there might be some less hard work <laughs> later on this evening. So welcome and have a most enjoyable and, and challenging afternoon discussion. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me come out of the uh, air conditioning. Uh, my name is Erin Snyder, and I'm a Gates alumna and uh, a newly established assistant professor at Texas. And I'm, I'm so happy to be back again. It's been several years, and it's, it's just a wonderful feeling to be back again after so long and to see so many familiar faces again. Um, it's also a pleasure to be back and to talk about the dynamics and challenges of uprisings that are now uh, continue to be ongoing in the Arab world with a really, really brilliant group of panelists today uh, whose experiences and breadth of work on the region couldn't really be better uh, for helping us reflect on the trajectory of events uh, since 2011 and kind of the path forward. Uh, I think many of you are well, are well aware that the spark for the uprisings really came in, in 2010, although the foundation you know, was many, many, many decades in the making. Uh, when Mohamed Bouazizi, a Tunisian street vendor, set himself on fire, in protest to the confiscation of his wares and the humiliation and harassment that he had endured from many, many government officials in Tunisia. His act of protest, of course, quickly became a catalyst for what became the Tunisian Revolution and, of course, the protest uh, that rapidly spread throughout the Arab world. Thereafter, of course, we know four entrenched authoritarian leaders to, from Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and Yemen uh, have since been swept from power, and others in the region, of course, have been forced to make some concessions, some political concessions, in response to new demands from their citizens. But of course, as the third anniversary approaches, and it's hard to believe it's almost been three years now, um, the initial euphoria of early 2011 has since been tempered by the challenges, of course, that one would expect in any revolutionary process, um, and by contraction, uh, by a great deal of contraction in the region. The military's intervention in Egypt this summer, the escalating crisis, of course, in Syria, and a slide back towards more authoritarian practices in Morocco, uh, with recent arrests and censorship of journalists in the past few months. And according to an a, a recent HS, HS, uh, HSBC uh, poll, I think, about two weeks ago, um, the Arab economies in general uh, will have uh, experienced, I think, $800 billion in losses um, over the last two years as well. So there are a great many uh, aspects uh, and challenges from the uprisings uh, of the last few years. So, of course, without question, there's a great deal of uncertainty about the way forward and many questions, of course, about the region's political and economic trajectory. International observers have somewhat stridently, I think, declared that recent events to be the end of democracy in the region. Um, so some of the questions to think about today is how seriously should we take these claims? Is there a role for international actors in aiding the transitions in the region? Do recent events in Egypt suggest increased conflict with Islamist parties uh, in the region as well? And does revolutionary change elsewhere in the world offer any meaningful examples or meaningful lessons rather for scholars trying to understand what's happening in the Middle East today. 
What are the most pressing challenges now for citizens hoping to affect some element of democratic uh, change in the region? So we're really, again, incredibly fortunate uh, to have a wide range of expertise on our panel today to help think through these and a great many other questions. And so I'll just start off uh, our panel discussion with uh, some brief words about our, our panelists. Uh, we're joined by uh, Maha Abdulrahman, who's a lecturer at the Center of Development Studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, her research covers a wide range of aspects of the sociology and politics of development. Uh, her current work focuses on the politics of the Arab Spring, of course, and the history of social and political struggles in the Arab Middle East and the me meaning of revolution in the 21st century. Uh, she's also the author of Egypt's Permanent Revolution, on protests and uprisings, which is very forthcoming uh, from Routledge. Um, we're also joined by Ian Black. Uh, Ian is the uh, Guardian's Middle East editor. Uh, and in more than f 25 years on the paper, he's also been its European editor, its diplomatic, his diplomatic editor, uh, foreign leader writer, and Middle East correspondent. Ian is also the co-author of Israel's Secret Wars, a history of Israel's intelligence services. And in 2010, Ian was awarded a Peace Through Media Award by the International Council for Press and Broadcasting. We're also joined by Hazm Kandil, who is a lecturer in political sociology at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of St. Catherine's College. Uh, his current research explores the socio-political ramifications of various military conscription regimes across history um, and is the author of Soldiers, Spies, and Statesmen, Egypt's Road to Revolt, uh, which uh, came out last year uh, with Verso and has another forthcoming pu uh, publication uh, with Polity Press uh, called Inside the Brotherhood. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our panelists today, and we're, I think we're going to start off with about 10 minutes uh, from each panelist, and then we'll open the floor up uh, to questions uh, from those who are watching outside of Cambridge, and of course, uh, folks here today. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Erin, and thank you everybody for welcoming here today for this wonderful uh, informal event of discussion. Uh, what Aaron put to us clearly, in my view, uh, sums up what uh, Lenin's famous adage was about, <laughs> uh, that there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks where decades take place. And that aptly describes the situation in the Arab region in the last three uh, years, uh, where we saw the downfall of several heads of states of residing over regimes that have been called uh, persistent authoritarian systems that managed to survive for decades. We also saw the rise of Islamist uh, governments through democratic means after being uh, operating as underground outlawed organizations for over eight decades as the case of the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt uh, was. And more recently, we've seen the ousting of some of these Islamist regimes, like the case of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, through a military coup backed by wide popular support. Uh, these momentous events could also be seen through a different lens. What we've seen in the last three years could also be understood as a revolution in its physical sense, meaning uh, a complete cycle of orbital movement. Uh, after three years, one could argue that not much has changed in the region, and I can speak about Egypt in particular. Uh, Egypt is still a country that is ruled by exceptional laws that undermine civil and political liberties, that allows the military trial of civilians. Uh, it's a country whose economic policy have been taken out of the same page as Mubarak's aggressive new liberal economic policies where the state security against which people had risen in the first place enjoys huge power to terrorize citizens and humiliate them on daily basis and where the military's economic power and political power are stronger than ever. In the middle of all the ruptures and continuities of the last three years, I think there has been one constant factor or one constant feature. That is the ability of millions of peoples to take to the street, to protest, and to take their grievances out against the regimes and the different governments. Still, in Egypt, millions of people go out on the street uh, to challenge uh, what they regard as systems of oppression with very little structures of mobilization or leadership. And that is a constant in the sense that it didn't only start in the last three years, but there is a whole decade 
uh, where Egyptians have been taking out to the streets, organizing protests, uh, almost 10 years that led up to the fall of Mubarak. Since the year 2000, Egyptians have been organizing around a repertoire of contentious actions uh, from factory workers to civil servants to housewives to small farmers to shantytown dwellers against what they regarded as the failure of the state uh, to, 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 to deliver uh, what the social pact that existed in Egypt for decades between the state and society uh, was in place. However, uh, despite this energy, despite the bravery of activists and protesters, and despite the fact that they still play an important role in raising important issues about who should be in power and who shouldn't, most of these activists, the networks they operate within, remain marginal to the political process. And they have had very little influence on the outcome of the political process which had dominated Egypt and mostly been reduced to a process of electoral politics. They had, their role has been hugely undermined and their ability to follow a transformative radical project which was at the core of the 18-day uprising of January 25th remains very limited compared to the power of well-established political uh, classes like the military, the Muslim Brothers, the Fulul, the Mubarak uh, political elite who are still well entrenched in state bureaucracy and so on and so forth. And I think it's time after three years to sit back and ask the question, was this inevitable? What happened to make the power of the people that made us all so feel so triumphant and euphoric, how come it has been so limited? And the question is not only for Egypt nor for the Arab region. Since 2011, we've seen the rise of large protest movements across the globe, from the Occupy uh, Wall Street and other Occupy movements to the Indignados to uh, anti-austerity protests in Greece and elsewhere. And we've seen the rise and rush of energy and promise and potential. Then quickly we've seen how these protest movements and activists have been sidelined and the major political economic powers have managed to continue with their uh, repressive, impoverishing policies. There are no lessons learned. I don't believe in lessons learned or deterministic outcomes. However, it's important to look at what happened and try to understand it. And in my view, I would just like to raise a few points about what I think uh, were the conditions that led to the ease with which the well-established power managed to sideline activists in Egypt in the last three years. Uh, the first point has to do, in my view, with the nature of organization, the type of networks and uh, political groups that have been active in Egypt for the last 10 years that were expected to be the vanguard of the Egyptian revolutions but did not materialize as such afterwards. For 10 years, most of these protests and the millions they managed to mobilize uh, worked outside of formal political organizations. If anything, they were completely averse to the idea of political organization in the traditional sense of political parties and so on. And that reminds me of the words of uh, a great thinker, Immanuel Wallenstein, who in his review of anti-systemic movements uh, concluded that what sets this generation of political activism from old uh, social movements in the 50s and 60s and before is the fact that they did not intend to capture state power. So the energy of Egyptian activists for a decade leading to the ousting of Mubarak was not uh, planned around the project of state domination. It was about challenging formal political structures and I think that applies to a lot of the protest movements across the globe today. They are not interested or invested in capturing or ne negotiating state power. So on the eve of Mubarak's downfall, we had protesters, we had energy, but we didn't have a structure around which a vision or long-term strategy could be planned. Another issue that relates specifically to Egypt was 
how easily the energy of protesters and activists uh, was polarized around identity and religion, religious questions. Most of Egypt's protesters and the energy that came behind it became polarized around a secular, so-called secular camp and a so-called Islamist camp. And that led to a huge fragmentation in, uh, in the possibility of creating a broad-based coalition. And in my view, it was not about secular versus Islamist. That was just a way that the political classes played on and a lot of the protest fell easily into in order to de derail the struggle from the main questions, the injustices of the political and the economic system. And finally, I think the last point was also the fact that the energy of protesters and the different struggles were fragmented along another dangerous line, which is political struggle versus economic struggles. We had the workers, we had the, the undermined uh, civil servants demanding better wages and improvements in life conditions. And on the other hand, we had political activists who were doing the real stuff of changing governments and amending constitutions. And there was a failure to bridge this gap and to understand that the two energies, that the two streams were important for creating any lasting and any tactical long-term coalition. To conclude, uh, have we seen the end of democracy in the Arab region as uh, Aaron put to us at the beginning? Uh, I don't believe that the chapter of the Egyptian revolution, we're seeing the last chapter in the story of the Egyptian revolution. Things might look like that. Uh, the military uh, power and the military coup last summer definitely could convince many that the, the, the story is finished, uh, not just because the military has so much power, but because it has the backing of what seems to be large sectors of the Egyptian population who only in July uh, asked and gave permission uh, in a public uh, wave of support to General el-Sisi and his colleagues. However, what, why I think it's not the end of the story is that nothing really has changed in terms of the structural conditions that led to the uprising in the first place. None of the new political elite or the political classes that have come to rule Egypt since the downfall of Mubarak have been brave enough or willing to touch and to seriously engage in restructuring the issues that made people revolt in the first place. The Muslim Brotherhood had a golden opportunity. They had legal, democratic legitimacy. Uh, they had a population that elected them and was willing to, to, to follow uh, the program they put forward. However, they did not touch the, the structures uh, that uh, people wanted to see transformed, like the police and security sectors, for example, or the economic policies. The current military regime does not seem interested, again, in anything but to fortify its political power. So in my view, as long as these underlying structures are still in place, the story has not yet ended and we're yet to see more developments. Thank you very much. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for um, inviting me. I, I am a journalist, and one of my favorite sayings about journalism is never lose your sense of the superficial. That is to say, don't forget that there are people out there who are your audience. Even if you don't know very much, they often know a lot less than you do. So let me be a very superficial journalist, just for a minute, by way of, by way of introduction. And tell, I'll say a little bit, I, I think Erin wanted me to, to do this, to talk a little bit about my job and how doing my job and how being a journalist and working for a, a major news organization has, has, has framed how I, and as a result of my work and of my colleagues and how many others have thus perceived this phenomenon of the Arab uprisings, the Arab Spring, or, or whatever, we're going to call it, whatever we're going to call it. So just I'll move from the sort of practical to the, to the, the, the broader picture. I think one of the most extraordinary things about this story is that... Um, it began barely noticed. We talked about Tunisia 
at the beginning in December 2010, some guy in a remote town in the interior of Tunisia, a country that not many people outside know very well at all, uh, in an act of personal desperation, uh, dramatized his own plight and the plight of many others of marginalized, unemployed youth living in a socially stifling and bureaucratic setting where there was simply no hope, no hope of ever moving out of the parental home, of getting married, of getting a decent job, all the things that young people everywhere aspire to. And it was interesting at the time and to look back at it now to see how quite quickly the, this, this uh, snowball, this fairly obscure story over a couple of weeks turned into something quite unprecedented in one of the I mean, all, all contemporary Arab states are dictatorships, I think. We'll perhaps make a, a small exception for Lebanon. But something quite extraordinary, it was a popular uprising against an entrenched Arab authoritarian state. And uh, suddenly there was a Tunisian revolution. And then suddenly, whoops, there was an Egyptian revolution, which was far more serious because that involved uh, 80 plus, 85 million people and was the most important country in the Arab world and therefore at the center of something uh, much, much bigger. And it was interesting, I think, from a media perspective, how, and I'm talking largely about the Western media here, it's true, but how the Western media, which was not really used to reporting very much on countries from Morocco to Iraq, unless there was some Western intervention involved, suddenly had to get quite interested in and to follow quite closely subjects that it had very little familiarity with. Um, Tunisia was a country that to outsiders was known only to the French because of the colonial uh, legacy. I, I, I don't think there was anybody in the, in the English-speaking world who had any knowledge of Tunisia at all. And I've been there a couple of times, but, and I'm supposed to be something of an expert on this part of the world. But Tunisia was an unknown backwater. Egypt was a different matter. And I think it was very striking to see for anybody in the Western media how for decades the focus of interest in the Middle East had been very, very heavily on Israel and Palestine, the conflict which remains in many ways the most, the most important international and regional conflict in that part of the world. Every, every news organization had correspondence based there. Everybody was used to really quite close and intense uh, coverage of it. And that simply wasn't true of the, of the wider Arab world, not of Tunisia, Egypt a little more because it was a big country, then uh, think of Libya, uh, which was associated with this you know, loopy Gaddafi terrorism, a, a peculiar place that nobody paid very much attention to. Then Bahrain, that mo most people, even if they were quite well informed, couldn't even find on a map, and so on and so forth. And suddenly, over, a over just a few weeks, at the beginning of 2011, Egypt was January, February, Libya, March, Bahrain around the same time, Suddenly, Syria took off in March. In an incredibly short space of time, there was a sort of domino effect, the sort of language that people used to use in the Cold War. And there appeared to be a connection between these events in different countries. And they're very different countries uh, in terms of, of wealth, development. Uh, I mean, the Gulf, perhaps, we should put to one side. And Bahrain is a special uh, case because it's very, very divided and sectarian. But... I digress from my point of trying to just to say that for the media, this was very challenging, it was new. But most of all, and Baha reminded me of this when she was speaking now, it was very dramatic. I think anybody who watched the events at Tahrir Square in Cairo in January and February 2011, however much or however little they knew about the subject, you really would have had to have a heart of stone not to be moved by the scenes that you saw of people you know, exulting in bringing about political change in a country where change had not taken place for decades. It was an extraordinary thing to see. And I think everybody was swept away by the drama, the th theatrics, and the emotion of that. The slogans, the songs, the images, I think, were very moving. And I think that may be an obvious thing to say, but I think it's important because as Maha, Maha or Baha? Maha. Maha pointed out. <laughs> Maha pointed out that there were things going on in Egypt, which is important because of its size, long before the 
revolution of January 2011, there were lots of struggles. There was worker struggles, and there was youth, and there was Khalid Saeed, who was killed by the police quite routinely in Alexandria. All kinds of things were going on. I remember a colleague of mine, Jack Schenker, who was, worked for the Guardian in Cairo for a few years uh, before and during the revolution, was a very talented correspondent. He used to complain, as journalists often do, how difficult it is to get a story into the paper, to get any interest in something, because he could see what was going on. He could see that there were interesting and important things going on. And he often used to say, it's very interesting what's happening in the, uh, in the, the, the trade unions in Egypt. There's a lot of labor unrest. It's a real challenge to the Egyptian state. But why aren't you interested in it? Why won't you run the stories? And one day, there was a strike that affected the Cairo Zoo. And the animals started suffering as a result. And I think a very ancient lion, unfortunately, died because the zoo workers weren't there to look after him. And suddenly, in a silly and superficial way, the media got interested. The Guardian ran a story about labor unrest in Egypt because there was a fun story about the Cairo Zoo and the suffering of the lion. And that was a way to tell the story. And it's always difficult. Anybody knows, anybody who's been a journalist knows that you have to make a story interesting, you have to make it come alive to get people's attention. But of course, getting people's attention was exactly what happened in Tahrir Square. So it was the drama and the focus of that that I think explains a lot of how people look, looked at, and I think still do look at, the events of the Arab Spring. Fast forward, nearly three years on, uh, it's a very different picture. As we know, the euphoria has faded. I think if you, ask, if you were to stop uh, anybody in the street here in Cambridge or anyone else and ask them about you know, what they knew, what was going on in the Middle East and the Arab world at the moment, they'd probably say, well, there's that terrible violence in Syria, isn't there? And they, might, they might have noticed that Egypt, because it's so big and important, had suffered, in effect, a counter-revolution. I'm, I'm flanked on both sides by Egyptians, and I'm not going to... <laughs> I'm being very careful what I say. But basically, I think you would all agree that the, the drama, the excitement, the hope, the euphoria that accompanied the beginning of this story has faded. So where, where are we now? I mean, this is all by way of introduction, and I'm sure there will be lots of, lots of questions. I just m made some notes to myself, thinking, you know, how many times in the last two and a half to three years have I taken part in discussions about the Arab Spring? Quite often, and I think correctly, people will, will stop and, uh, on the question of, of the name. I, I, you've used the name Arab Spring. I, I, I don't think the word Arab Spring is appropriate anymore. I think that we might choose a more neutral term of uprisings or something like that. But of course, if you followed this story, you will know people have got, talked about Arab Springs and Islamist winters, and you can play with metaphors about the autumn and so on and so forth. <laughs> the best line that I saw recently, somebody was giving a talk and they said, after the Arab Spring, do we need a summer of love? Which I thought was a, which I thought was a great line, and a slightly silly way to make the point, I think, that the seasonal metaphor has, has uh, outlived its, uh, its usefulness. Um, uh, overall, the picture, I think, is unremittingly grim. I can't really see much in the way of uh, light uh, in, the, in the darkness. But I think that's different from trying to draw a conclusion, which I think we want to do here, uh, to try and take stock and to say, where are we? Is it all over? Is that the end of the story? Are, are, the, are the grand hopes and dreams uh, uh, all, all, all dead? I, I, a couple of things that I think are worth thinking about are a sense of, of time. Uh, nearly three years it's been going on, but th nearly three years is but the, you know, the, blink of a, the blink of an eye on, on, any, on any scale that you want to choose for measuring human development and human history. And it seems to me that um, too many people have been too quick to make uh, hasty judgments on the basis of what has happened over this period, simply because in almost every situation I can think of, and it's true of Egypt and it's true of the worst current example, which is Syria, and it's true of Libya, which is another very glaring example of uh, initial hope and excitement having given way to uh, pessimism and gloom about the present situation. Everywhere, the problems that uh, people are struggling with across the Arab world are essentially inherited problems from decades of dictatorship and underdevelopment. They're not, in my view, that certainly mistakes have been made People have been, and I include the media and myself in this too, people have been naive and short-sighted and have made foolish calculations. But I think the fundamental point I would make is if you think everywhere is in a mess from, 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 uh, uh, from, 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 from Libya to, uh, to Syria, the thing to focus on is the, 
the legacy of the decades that passed before these uprisings took place and before, in some cases, the dictators were overthrown, obviously in others, in the case of Syria, where they're still fighting. So I think that sense of a long haul and, uh, and inherited problems are two very important points, uh, which, which slightly goes ag against the current sort of fashionable thinking, which says, well, you know, it's all, it's all been a disaster, Egypt's a military dictatorship again, uh, and everything's over. I think that one thing that has changed uh, that's very important but hard to quantify are people's expectations. I do think that there is a case here for the, using the, the, the old image of the, the genie that can't be put back in the bottle. I think that's true because of what people have experienced in their own countries at the moments of hope and excitement and euphoria, even the, if those are now past. But I also think it's true because one of the uh, most significant aspects of this whole story of what's happened, what's been going on in the Arab world, is, is about globalization. It's about a sense that people uh, are no longer shut off from other people's countries and cultures and political systems and experience. And they have the internet and YouTube uh, and uh, the digital revolution, which allows them, even in the most appalling situations, even in the, if you're under curfew in the streets of Cairo or cowering in a suburb of Damascus, you can still see what is happening in the wider world. And you can see how people live elsewhere. It's true in, 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 a, in a different but related context, I would argue, of uh, Palestine and Israel, where people who live in appalling conditions in the Gaza Strip, locked up in a giant prison camp, know that uh, five miles up the road, Israelis are living in a, a first world uh, society and economy. And the contrast is unbearable. And I think that that is true of the whole region, that. Uh, the, the, the manifestations of globalization which have been around throughout this period and predate it to uh, means that the, the status quo, the old status quo, is not, is not, uh, is not sustainable. I think it affects uh, uh, important social issues like the status of women. I think that for all the gloom and doom about Egypt, I would argue, uh, deferring again to the Egyptian colleagues here, that... that, 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 that that, that women are in a better situation after the start of uh, their own uh, revolution than they were before. And I think on the question of Islamism, of it, the power of Islamist groups and movements in the Arab world, which has been a very important feature across the board, um, I think it's also a case for not making premature judgments. I'd really be interested to hear from Hazan and Maha about this in Egypt, but there's a lot of focus on Islamist, there's a lot of talk about how Syria has become a theater for Islamist extremists. And it's certainly true that Islamist extremists are part of the story in Syria, but of course that's what the Syrian government, the Syrian government would like you to believe, that the choice is between Bashar al-Assad and al-Qaeda, which I think is untrue and a false choice and essentially propaganda. So there's a big question, again, to be measured over time as to what actually has happened to Islamist Movements. I'm saying this on the assumption, I, I, need, I need to be explicit here, in my view, generally speaking, Islamist movements have not proved themselves to be progressive. I'm, I'm making that assumption, I should perhaps be more explicit about it. So long haul, inherited problems, early judgments, um, and perhaps just to finish, I would say, if you, know, if you want me to be journalistic and superficial, which I'm always happy to do, I would say what we have is, that the, in the big picture, the, the old status quo has gone, and it's not going to come back, despite reversing it. Uh, but what's going to replace it in the longer term is still unclear. And I think that is still to play for in, in most of the places that we're likely to want to talk about. Thank you. Well, the conventional wisdom about what was happening in Egypt um, was that the military has been dominating the regime over the last 60 years of its establishment. Uh, in 2011, they saw Mubarak as a liability, so they ousted him. Um, and the same thing was repeated this summer. When they saw Morsi might be threatening um, their power, they overthrew him. My analysis of the Egyptian situation kinds of points into a, a more complicated picture. Um, and, you know, I would be happy to share it today with you uh, with the hope of making the disturbing events of last summer 
a bit more um, comprehensible, though not more optimistic. Um, I do not conceive of the Egyptian regime as, um, as one unified bloc. I conceive of it as this power triangle, uh, a partnership between three institutions, the military, the security, and the political institution. And it was my um, conclusion on the eve of the 2011 revolt that the military had become the least privileged partner in this uh, ruling bloc and that Egypt had turned um, effectively into a police state where the security institution became the leading power. And for that particular reason, um, the military did welcome the opportunity to get rid of Mubarak so it can renegotiate power within the ruling bloc um, and re-dominate it in a way that it has not been the case since the 1960s and early 1970s. And this in fact did happen. The military since 2011 has become again uh, the most dominant uh, player and it did not necessarily mind undermining its longtime rival, the security institution, if it had found a political partner willing to carry out this process with it. But because the revolution from day one decided to place the military and the security in one basket, um, they ended up acting as partners um, instead of possible competitors. So in the transitional period, um, which continued over the last two years, we had the military rising to most dominant position, security completely intact despite everything that happened, and the only vacant seat was actually the political seat. Um, and there were three possible candidates that were kind of scrambling to fill out this vacant seat. The first was the Muslim Brotherhood, the second were remnants of the old regime, and the third was the civil activists who kind of collectively represented the revolution. Now, of course, the first condition for who would fill that role is that this candidate has to be accepted by the military and by the security. And the Muslim Brotherhood did not seem to be um, quite problematic to any of them. Um, politically, it made sense. It was uh, the most organized and so would stabilize the situation. At the same time, it was not the old regime, so it would give a sense that something did change. And, importantly, the Brotherhood at not, no point, before or after coming to power, hinted at undermining the privileges of the military or challenging its power in any possible way. And even more importantly, um, it adopted a very appeasing policy towards the security institution from the very first moment of the revolt. So while people were still in Tahrir Square in, in the 1st of February, they were negotiating with Mubarak's top security chief a deal to abandon the revolution uh, in, in uh, exchange for a larger share of the political pie. Um, they routinely supported the repression of civil activists throughout the transitional period. Uh, blaming the victims, those that were killed and wounded during uh, confrontations with the police, mocking them sometimes, uh, famously referring to them as, you know, what sent them over there, meaning they deserved what was coming to them. Um, and when they came to Parliament, they refused to make any move to hold the security institution accountable. And when Morsi became president, he actually went as far as um, describing the security institution as a partner in the revolution an esteemed partner in this great revolution. And despite the fact that not a single officer had been held accountable for anything they did over the last 30 years, he said that this great patriotic institution has already been rehabilitated. So it was very clear to everyone that um, the Muslim Brotherhood was not really spearheading a revolution or a revolutionary policy against either the military or the police. So it's pure fiction that the Muslim Brotherhood was spearheading a revolution and then was overthrown by a counter-revolution over the summer. That there was this lost opportunity. There wasn't any lost opportunities. Now, the problem then that uh, Egyptians faced and the military and security faced was purely political. Because whoever came to power did not have the willingness or the ability to challenge them. The political question was who can stabilize 
the situation after this uprising. Um, the problem is that our three players found themselves um, stuck in what I call a balance of weakness. Neither of them can occupy this political seat on its own and stabilize the situation. There was a deadlock and alliances were needed to break that deadlock. And so what we saw under Morsi was simply an attempt by the Brotherhood to either negotiate a deal with the old regime elements, who had a strong foothold in the bureaucracy, and so kind of abandoned the street, which was very possible, or negotiating a deal with the civil activists and kind of creating a revolutionary front against the old regime. The problem with the Brotherhood is that um, they decided that they are smart enough to play them against each other running to the old regime and claiming that, you know, we are the only uh, dam that protects you from these crazy, hard-headed maniacs. Uh, and so make a deal with us. All kinds of emissaries going to the jailed leaders of the old regime and all kinds of negotiations going on. And at the same time running to the revolutionaries and saying, well, we're the only people who have the stamina and the organization to actually implement your agenda. Unfortunately, the Brotherhood is not so politically inept that they could not really play that game and it became very obvious from the beginning that they were just trying to buy time while they were consolidating their power at the apex of the authoritarian regime just replacing Mubarak um, and his cronies by appeasing the military and security um, and getting rid of its two other rivals. So it was only normal, not necessarily moral, but it was only, only normal that the two other competitors would come together in a very odd yet tactical alliance together. The old regime and the revolutionary activists would come back uh, together in a tactical alliance against um, the Muslim Brotherhood. And so from the moment uh, it became clear that Morsi wasn't going to make a deal with any of them, uh, there was a two-thronged campaign to overthrow the Brotherhood. The old regime, through its control of the media, public and private, judiciary, the bureaucracy, made the country ungovernable, sabotaged everything that the Brotherhood tried to do. Um, and the civil activists on the street continued agitation against the Brotherhood, turning people against them. And so, by the end of the year, in December, it became clear that the country was going towards a confrontation. The military thinking that it was going to relief itself of the headache of domestic politics for quite some time, found itself again in this very turbulent situation. Uh, the general commander asked the Brotherhood to try to reach some kind of a deal with your competitors. That's not going to continue. He did that in November. Uh, the Brotherhood refused to accept this mediation. And then something quite disturbing happened in December is that when people surrounded the presidential palace, um, the president asked the military or the police to repress them. They didn't. And so they called in the Brotherhood militia to repress them. And this for the military was a preview of what might have happened this summer had they not intervened. You had the militia coming in, um, clearing the sit-in uh, with dozens of uh, uh, people killed and wounded and tortured um, during that process. And so, right before June the 30th, uh, some of us who were interested were, were following that. The military explained to the Muslim Brotherhood that you have one week before June the 30th to reach some kind of a settlement. They refused. June the 30th happened. Millions of people uh, came out to the streets. Uh, I'm not going to play the game of numbers. Three million, 33 million, millions. You know, for us who were there, the country was completely packed with demonstrations. They showed the president the footage uh, recorded from helicopters. Well, you see, there is real opposition. You need to make a deal. Uh, the president insisted this was a Photoshop revolution, despite the fact that you cannot really Photoshop video footage, but, you know, this was a technical problem. The military gave him another 48 hours. He still refused. And so I think that the military was faced with three options. First option is follow the orders of the president, repress these people, carry out the same role that the Iranian military carried out in 2009, and then be accused of supporting a narrowly based Islamist regime. 
Second option was not to do anything and just stand back and see a repeat of what happened in December, but only on a much more spectacular scale, uh, and risk being placed in the same position as the Lebanese army uh, in 1975, where just watch the country descend into civil war. The third option, um, the best of three evils, was to intervene and support the political camp that seemed to have a better chance on the long run of stabilizing the situation, which clearly was this odd alliance of um, civil activists representing the revolution and uh, old regime elements, which is exactly what happened. Now, where does that leave us? Unfortunately, it leaves us with, um, on the short term, a much more reinvigorated police state. Um, and I just want to make it very clear that this was understood by people in the summer. Egyptians consciously decided that if we're going to have a police state anyway, one serving the Brotherhood or one serving something that resembles the old regime, let us stick with the devil we know. We would rather resummon the Shah than live and watch a new Khomeini, you know, rise to power. People accept that. Accept this kind of Faustian, you know, deal with their tormentors. People know that. That being said, um, what would happen on the long term, I think I agree with Mahan, I agree with Ian, and it's not very, very clear, but let me just point out a few different things that might add to what they said. Um, the person who carried out this intervention is a very mysterious fellow, General Commander, you know, Sisi. He might have plans to become a new Nasser, a new Ataturk. This might mean that Egypt might be much better or much worse, but it would at least be different than what it was like under Mubarak. Second probable uh, uh, scenario is that we will have more instability after we get rid of the Brotherhood because of the same structural problems that were there before. Poverty and repression and so on will lead to increasing instability and it remains an open question uh, where this might, might lead to. So, I think that this is where we are right now and if there's one big change that I always regret has been ignored uh, this summer is that the biggest loser is Islamism in general, not just the Muslim Brotherhood. I think there is a groundbreaking, radical change in the fortune of Islamism and Islamist movements in Egypt and beyond because of what happened. And I think it has been um, swept under the rug by people who are just thinking mostly about is this a coup, is this democracy, and forgetting about um, the future of this very important movement that we've been writing about for the past you know, 20 years. Or, or 30 years, um, the Islamist movement. Thank you very much for you know, giving me a chance to share this with you. Thank 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 you. Thank
for a certain historical reality. They worked in cross-ideological coalitions, in organizations without central power. Most of the organizations like Kifaya and even the labor strikers worked through committees that coordinated activities rather than made decisions for the long term. And they definitely were very suspicious of state power, hence did not see it as an objective. And that uh, goes back to the history of all social movements where capturing state power was the most important thing and history has showed generations of activists that once in power it's the same old story again. Uh, the thing is, uh, at the downfall of Mubarak or any other regime, uh, you need different kind of skills in order to be engaged in the redrawing of the rules of the game. And uh, they are quite different from the skills that these activists had developed. Uh, they are about tactical, long-term strategies of capturing state institutions and so on and so forth. What I'm trying to say is that we have to understand that and be clear and it's up to new generations of activists to decide what they want to do. If it's about challenging global structures of capital and power, uh, that's one thing, but what happens the day after? Activists have no plan in the case of Egypt for the day after, grand or otherwise. Uh, it's important to ask this question. There might be a day after. <laughs> it's a possibility that for a decade in Egypt we never thought about, and I think activists elsewhere, when you're challenging uh, global financial institutions, the World Bank and global capitalism, you really don't entertain the thought of the day after because we know it's not going to happen. But at least in certain cases within limited um, opportunity for redrawing or being involved, invited somehow to the table to redraw the, the rules of the game, it's very important for us as activists everywhere to start asking what do we want to happen afterwards. Hi, um, my name is Simone Bonenberger. Thank you um, to the panelists for a fascinating um, analysis of what's happening in Egypt. Um, just a quick question. Um, arguably, the hallmark of any authoritarian regime is to successfully prevent the development of a feasible opposition, which, if the day comes, can see through a transition. The question I have to the panel is, is there a role for the West in Egypt? If yes, what should it look like? I didn't catch the last... If there's, a role for the, if there's a role for the West, what should it look like, if I understood correctly? Yeah. Does anyone want to...? <laughs> well, you, saw, I mean, you look, look at the reality of what's actually happened. Is perhaps the, uh, I, I think that the United States was slow to abandon Mubarak and was criticized for doing that. It then embraced, embrace is perhaps the wrong word, no, I think embrace maybe is quite a good word. And then it, when Morsi became president uh, in 2012, the United States, which is the most important player, uh, was uh, cautiously welcoming. And some people say, and I think there is some justice in this, that the Americans were uh, and the British too, and, other, and the Europeans, were far too uh, uh, uncritical in the way that they dealt with Morsi. There was a sense in which none of them had ever dealt with an elected Islamist government before. It had been a taboo. Suddenly you had an Islamist uh, government, and they forgot all the things that they'd worried about before. Uh, and when Morsi was in power, they, I think, didn't understand sufficiently, and I don't think this is just the American government or other Western governments, I think it's true of the media as well. I don't think that uh, outsiders understood sufficiently how unpopular Morsi was. Uh, so I think there's a lesson there about uncritical, uh, uncritically embracing the status quo, whatever it is. It used to be Mubarak and then suddenly it was uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. I think a kind of critical engagement that, uh, that encourages the development of 
anything that comes under the heading of civil society is the most important thing that any uh, outsiders can do. Of course, when, the, when Egypt, if you're the United States, if Egypt is uh, one of the central pieces of your whole strategy in the Middle East, then you face a contradiction between your strategic interests, uh, which are enduring, and your shorter-term political calculations. And that, I think, is where uh, the Americans, at least, fell down uh, in Egypt. But I, uh, speaking for myself, I, uh, as a journalist, I felt that uh, outsiders did not understand how unpopular Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, had become. And thus you saw in Egypt, you saw vicious attacks on the mm -hmm. American ambassador in particular. So uh, uh, an irony, America was criticized for, for holding on to Mubarak for too long and then embracing uh, Morsi too closely. I think if you go beyond those points, the answer has to be that outsiders who are able to influence, whether through uh, uh, economic assistance or subtle pressure, uh, should do all they can to encourage the emergence of, uh, of, of civil society, which is capable of challenging uh, uh, the status quo. And that's true not only of Egypt, but the entire region, I would say. If I may just add one point to, to Ian's intervention. The question, the very question of what should the West do implies a neutral stance. First, a homogenous uh, entity that is the West, and second, that the West is a neutral player that's waiting back there to see us advise them on what they should best do. I mean, the question of interest is at the heart of this discussion. Uh, the American administration, as well as European governments and governments elsewhere, have a keen vested interest in the region and they have been choosing their allies very carefully over the decades and as Ian said, uh, most Western governments not only tolerate Mubarak but they actually regarded him as their best ally in the region and his policies as uh, perfectly fitting within the aid policies and support that they were giving to the region. So we should be also careful about assuming that there is a neutral uh, West out there that has not already made its mind about what is the best way of going about uh, dealing with the region. That uh, was a very nice um, analysis presented by the panelists. Um, where uh, a journalist's view was presented and also a nicely dissected uh, view of uh, the problem. My question really is, uh, if there was um, and how um, the role of media, global and local, in the, in the political uh, alliances between the parties against the Muslim Brotherhood play a role in, in the uprising? And how did it manifest in the rest of the uprising events across? Middle East. Well, uh, let me just take a shot at that because there's one point I was, um, was trying to make. I think we discussed this uh, in Cairo when Ian was down there. Um, there is a sense that the uh, public and private media played a big role in um, turning people against Islamists. And it is completely true that the public and private media, quite unprofessionally, uh, led a very strong anti Islamist campaign. But the truth is, this is a very kind of superficial view of events for two reasons. First reason is, the media that uh, helped turn people most against Morsi was the Islamist media. Um, most people who I met demonstrating against Morsi, uh, holding very violent positions against the Brotherhood during this summer, got their views either from watching Al Jazeera, which kind of broadcast live 24 hours from the sit-in, and they heard with their own uh, ears what some of the Islamists were saying. And some people who actually were on the receiving side of Islamist violence in, in places like Bin Sarayat and Manya. There's uh, something very important here that we forget. Islamists had a very carefully minted discourse towards outsiders. It was very different from how they talked amongst themselves. Now, in this very odd situation, they found themselves necessarily having to just speak out to their followers, hundreds of thousands with them, in one central place. And so Egyptians were lividly shocked at hearing some of the things um, that were being said 
amongst Islamists. They never und thought that, you know, Islamists thought this way or, you know, planned uh, to act in, in this way. Secondly, and quite related to that, Egyptians are quite immune to propaganda because we have been living for 60 years under an uh, authoritarian regime. Egyptians reserve the word, you know, press talk to lies. When you want to, you know, describe someone as lying, you would say this is, well, this is press talk, right? So it was very unlikely that they would believe that. So when I hear reporters, foreign reporters saying, well, you know, the Egyptian media is, is talking about this, uh, turning the brothers into terrorists, there is nothing new. M Nasser tried to turn the brotherhood into terrorists. Mubarak described the brotherhood at some point as terrorists, threatening national security. People never bought it before. And the question we need to ask ourselves, why did they buy it this time? And it is because they got their knowledge directly from the source, from Islamists in the street and through Islamist media. I have a question following on from that about media coverage. By the way, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, my question is regarding the role of social media. How far has it aided or abetted this uh, kind of revolution that's going on? And do you think it's doing justice or it's only spreading lies, as you would say? <laughs> well, um, you know, Various labels have been used to describe the, these events. We've had, we've had the, we had the WikiLeaks revolution in Tunisia, you might remember, and we've had uh, Twitter revolutions in Egypt and elsewhere. And uh, you've seen things like YouTube have been enormously important. I mean, my, uh, I, I come, I'm old enough to come from the old media that predates the incredible explosion of digital media that we now completely take for granted. But having said that, I've overcome the disadvantages of my great age to, I think, to understand how important these um, media have been. I have a very, very vivid memory of being in Syria in uh, about, I think, in early 2012. And I'd gone to Syria with a, a visa from the government. There are two ways of going to Syria. One is with permission from the government, and the other is to smuggle yourself across the the border usually from Turkey or from Lebanon to be with the, uh, the opposition forces, with the rebel forces. So I'd gone to Syria with government permission, but I managed to leave Damascus in a sort of semi-trandestine way, and I'd gone to a town not too far away called Zabadani, which is uh, in, the, uh, in the mountains near the border with Lebanon. And this, at the time, was held by the Free Syrian Army, which was one of the, at the time, was the, one of the most important of the, of the rebel uh, units. And it was all a bit frightening and difficult. And I got to this, this town uh, by a devious route, changing cars and roadblocks and generally being quite frightened. And Anyway, getting there in the evening, and there were lots of men with guns. And it, all was, it was all very colorful and interesting and quite scary. And uh, when I changed cars for the last time to do the last stretch of, the, uh, of this, this slightly spooky journey, I got into the car. And three people in the car all turned to me, and they were all filming. And I said, why are you filming me? And they said, because it's important. And then we got to the town square where there was a demonstration going on. And they were calling for the overthrow of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and everybody was filming. And a man was filming, and he said, you know, this is holding up. It was an iPhone or something like that. And he said, this is, I'm going to send this straight to YouTube. This is our most important weapon. And it was very moving, and it was, they really wanted to show, they were shouting slogans, and it was a night demonstration, and it was a moving manifestation of a popular uprising. And they were going to upload it to YouTube, and the whole world could see it, and the whole world has seen it. And the whole world has seen lots of things on YouTube for the last two and a half to three years. And if you look at Syria, it's made absolutely no difference whatsoever. There are 100,000 people or more who have been killed in Syria. Uh, YouTube and Twitter, and uh, none of these things have made any difference. They, these are uh, uh, tools for organization. In the Egyptian case, I'm sure you would agree. Mm -hmm. Useful. Facebook, this demonstration is happening here. Uh, S you know, SMS messages that you can use to get people together. They're tools. In my view, they're no more than that. They're no different from the leaflets that uh, appeared in different revolutions in different places in the past. We've over... Uh, we've overemphasized their importance. Yes, they're important, but they're part of the scene. They haven't defeated anybody yet. Mm. Great. We've got time for one, one last question, very brief. It seems to me, I really enjoyed this discussion, it seems to me a lot of this is about 
who has the right to speak on behalf of others um, and what, what gives a particular group uh, a warrant to speak on behalf of others. And then in the case of the panelists, how we can learn from you about what the, the truth is out there and this question about social media brings us back to this, this yearning for transparency, for a direct experience of the truth. And I guess my question is how has the events of the last three years, how can you reflect on your own um, warrant to speak about what has transpired and in what ways have the events changed your ability to access information? Has it made it easier or more difficult? <coughs> a difficult one. <laughs> um, well, I think you're asking for a personal reflection and it will remain that, I'm afraid. Uh, I think the events of the last 13 years in my case, because I've been involved in closely following the, the protests and the mobilization that was taking place in Egypt in the lead up to the 25 January uprising, has changed the way I regard uh, social and political realities very much, not the realities, but uh, I've become less cynical than I used to be, my, than my younger self. <laughs> I find myself uh, uh, having more trust and belief in the ability to change things than before. Um, uh, and part of cynicism is that you try and distance yourself it's not me, things are not changing and I'm not part of them and I have no right to speak on things. So I was much more detached even as an academic in my research. What the changing events have done is to make me more grounded in, in reality and to actually not lose the, the confidence to speak but actually to acquire more sense of confidence of speaking, not to present the truth as such but to present myself as part of this larger truth, if that makes any sense. Anyone else would like to speak to that? Or? With that, I think that's, it was a wonderful question, I think, to end our, our session today. And I just want to thank again Maha, Ian, and, and Hesem for a really fascinating panel. And it's a, it's a lot to ask people to, uh, to summarize uh, the events of the past a very, very tumultuous last three years. But I think that we had really a wonderful discussion on some of the most important topics and themes, and, and certainly a lot to think about uh, for discussion uh, and thereafter. So uh, join everyone, uh, I'd like to, to join everyone in thanking our panelists today.